Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 310th episode of Real Hawk Talk. I am Brian Nemhauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger. And this is a good one tonight. There's been a lot of good content out there lately. I got a lot of good conversations. And we are bringing back one of our favorite guests. It's been a while. It might have been even been years, like a couple of years since we've had Mike back on the show. But Michael Sean Dugar is back on the show from The Athletic and very eager to talk with him about the Seahawks offseason, the upcoming draft, and including an article he just published that just hit uh, about his latest mock draft that includes some trades for the Seahawks and a pick in the first round that not many people are projecting. I will intro- I'll bring Mike on in just a second. First, I want to say welcome to Jeff Simmons at Real Jeff Simmons. Jeff, it is wild out there right now with draft season. Uh, did you get a chance to read Mike's article? I did. I did. I, I'm I'm addicted to mock drafts. So like, whenever <laughs> I see a new one, oh, Mike's had some cool stuff lately, though, man. Uh, his pods have been really good lately. So yeah, I, I've been all over it. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Love you guys. Absolutely. So, so Mike, if you have not, for whatever reason, have not run into Mike, and I will officially welcome him into the show now. Mike not only writes for The Athletic, but also has the Man to Man podcast, which is a fantastic pod. If you're not checking that out, you should be. And I say this whether he's on the air or not, but they're not all beat writers uh, are equal. And Mike is one of the best. He and Brady Henderson are my guys uh, that I trust and look to for not just reporting what's going on with the Seahawks, but for having enough analytical ability to look a little bit behind, a little bit in between the lines about what's going on and to have a unique perspective on what's going on and not just to follow the crowd. So an absolute must follow on Twitter at Mike Dugar, D-U-G-A-R. Mike, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. That's a hell of an introduction. I'm the best one I've ever got. So uh, thank thank you, man. I'm, I'm uh, happy to be on. You guys' show is big time, uh, uh, too. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate it. Well, I mean, when, when we first had you on, you were just getting started on the beat, I think. Like, it was maybe even your first year or second year on the beat at that point. It was, when did you start? 2017, I was with the Seattle PI. So the uh, first year, the year the Legion of Boom kind of fell apart physically. That was my first year. I'll never forget it. Okay. So I think it might have been maybe like your second year with the the first year with the athletic or something like that. But it was it was a little bit later than that. Uh, How are things going, man? Are you you still enjoying the gig? I I hear you got personal news. Is that is that right? Uh, Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, my daughter is eight months now. She was born um, like five, five days before camp. Um, and I was at camp every day of people who, you know, follow my work. So that was, a uh, every, every article you read from me in camp was definitely caffeine infused and, and sleep deprived, uh, <laughs> that first month or two of the season and camp. And uh, as you guys can see, I went to every game still and never missed a practice. Not to, I don't need a pat on the back or anything. I'm just doing my job, but all the parents listening right now know that that is, a that is one hell of a, of a grind when you have the, a little one in the in the house and you're just trying to get anything done let, let alone work you just want to shower wash the dishes do some laundry whatever the hell make a sandwich you know it's all every you're on somebody else's time so uh it, that was definitely a grind still in the grind uh, i appreciate the shout out and the work i've done this off season because that stuff is coffee infused uh, <laughs> as well and sleep deprived uh especially this off season my fiance went back to work uh in january so everything i've been doing this off season is doubling as uh on daddy duty as well so yeah one one hell of a grind last uh eight months or so is this your first yeah first first kid uh then i'm also getting married in june so that's uh, Congrats, another man. milestone hitting this year yeah i'm gonna having a good year uh it's this has been the year that i've probably stayed off social media the most mm. uh just being so so busy uh i probably unfortunately haven't been in, diving into all the draft stuff that i usually do like my editor and I were going over some stuff like, hey, uh, let's do some stuff that worked last year. And he was revisiting some of the articles that I did last year. And he was like, yo, you were grinding. Uh, and not to say I don't usually grind, but having the fifth pick, I was all in last year. I went yeah. to the Senior Bowl last year, owners yeah. meetings, combine. 
That's like the big three of the events in the offseason. And went to all of those, watched all the film on like all the quarterbacks except Bryce. Like I was dialed in on the whole process last year. I'm still locked in now, but last year was like, I was a beast. That was actually the most fun too, having the fifth pick. Like just as you guys know, that's just not a space we get to operate in in Seattle, having such a high pick where you actually get to see a kid like Anthony Richardson or Will Anderson. I'm like, wow, let me look at his tape because they might take him. Not just out of curiosity, like I was doing the other day watching like Roma Dunze. I was like, oh, this guy's going to be fun for someone else. Um, but like last year it was like, oh, Anthony Richardson would be fun today in Seattle. Yeah. Obviously he didn't show up, but yeah, that, last year was a lot like that was the the real, real grind for uh, Jeff. You probably loved last year with all it was a mock every day doing something different with, with pick five last year. That was fun. I think Jeff and I probably did. 300 mock drafts just between the two of us. <laughs> they were pretty sick. <laughs> There's so yeah. much you can do with pick five, man. That was a, uh, that was a, that it, was a fun time. Well, that, that's a, I got to ask. Um, and just as one quick aside before I do, I mean, first, par- first kid, first time parenting, first time co-parenting while doing a job, you know, in the same house uh, it is, it is an experience, man. And it is something people talk about having kids makes you grow up. And that is one part of it's true. You cannot prioritize your own needs in the same way. And you got to be flexible in new ways. And everything all of a sudden that used to feel fixed becomes variable, you know? And so uh, I, I respect how much uh, you've been able to get done while battling that change. And, you know, as someone who's got older boys now i can say uh it, it does get easier hopefully at some point but uh you know it's it's rough the first the first uh, go of it for sure so you, you're talking about last year in the fifth pick and we're going to talk mostly about this year but i got to rewind for a second so was who were you one expecting the seahawks to take with the fifth pick and two who did you think they should take with the fifth pick? Was it the same person or, or a different person? It's a good question. I think I w- by the by draft night, I was on the trade back train. I just I, because I had learned enough to know the quarterbacks will be gone. Um, I wasn't a big Levis guy, and the, the league kind of followed me uh, on that. So I wasn't a big Levis guy. I was a big Anthony Richardson guy, but I was like, there's no way he gets by. Um, yeah, he went to Indy, and I remember. I don't know if I found out in Indy or later um, that the homie Steven, he already wrote this piece now, but Steven Holder did like a, a, he followed, he works for Indianapolis or he's out of Indianapolis is like the national guy used to be our Colts guy. He did like a thing where he followed Anthony Richardson around the combine. He ended up dropping the piece later. I think I knew about that piece at some point And I was just like, Steven ain't doing that off. Like no whim, you know, like he, he knows something. He's a veteran dude. So I was like, all right, let me scratch Anthony off of this. So by that time, by draft night, I'm pretty sure. I think I wrote this draft week, too, to be like, hey, trade back. You're not going to get what you want. I was out on Jalen Carter um, just for the off-field stuff. On the field, I knew he'd be a dude. I just knew. I got. I gathered enough intel to know even if I would take him because it's not my money, I knew the Seahawks would not give him whatever the signing bonus was for the fifth pick last year. That's just not – it just wasn't going to happen. I could just feel that. So at that point, I was like, yeah, just go ahead and trade back. I didn't realize, because in that scenario, I was like, you can still get someone like Spoon. I think I was out on Tyree Wilson um, at mm-hmm. that time. A take that has <laughs> aged pretty well um, over uh, in Vegas. I don't know how happy they are with him. See, so, yeah, I think I was on the trade back train. I can't remember who I would have liked on the trade back. I'd probably have to go check one of my mocks. But I was nah. for sure like move from five to nine or whatever. You can get out of the out of the first round. Because it felt very similar to this year to spin a little forward. Like the when you're in the top ten or the top five, for me personally, there's only a few positions I'm even considering. Like that, I scratched like half the roster off the list. I'm probably not taking a guard. Probably not taking a center. I'm probably not taking a nose tackle. Yeah, well, I miss out on like a Vita Vey every once in a while or something, or uh, Quentin Nelson probably. But more often than not, I'm not missing on one of those guys. So if it's not receiver, uh, quarterback, tackle, corner, edge. Yeah, I don't need those. I'm not like in desperate need of those things. You can throw me out of the out of the top five or the top ten. Uh, I didn't think Will Anderson would get to them. I didn't think the Texans would take him. I just didn't think they'd get to him. So yeah, I was pretty firm on the trade back by the by draft night. Um, 
if you're just like, oh, take the best talent for the position you need, I would have been huge on on uh, Jalen Carter. He was exactly what they needed. Uh, he was he – was, it's, mm-hmm. Usually, I wouldn't say take a defensive tackle that early, but you just watch Jalen and you're like, oh my God, he's everything the Seahawks need. So much so they ended up trading for that exact type of guy him. what four months later or whatever. So that's how badly they needed him. Um, but yeah, I was, I, I think by the very end, I was like, yeah, trade back, get some assets, take something else, uh, because you're just not going to get the value you need at five. So yeah, I wasn't, wasn't a huge spoon guy, probably because I thought you could get him later. Um, but yeah, I, did, I don't think I saw the spoon thing come in until maybe like a day day or so before the draft. But like mm-hmm. up until then, I thought I was pretty surprised by that. So as we kind of transition into talking about what they've done since then, uh, Seahawks made a number of moves this offseason. And as we're talking about your article that, that just dropped today, even this afternoon uh, for The Athletic about mock draft, you started by talking about that John Schneider, Mike McDonald have left themselves a lot of work to do mm-hmm. and that they really have to nail this draft. And I want to give you a chance to say a little bit more about that. And when you look at this offseason, the Seahawks have gone through so far, the first one in the post Pete Carroll era, the first one where John Schneider is the final say on personnel, the first one where Mike McDonald is a head coach. What is your assessment of you know, what the Seahawks have done this off season. Their moves definitely reflect uh, a general belief inside the building that like Pete and his guys were the problem. Pretty much. Um, you can just tell by the moves. They, they change. It feels like they change a lot. Then you go back and chart it out and you're like, Oh, not really. You know, they, they changed some names, but for the most part, they're asking Mike, Mike McDonald, that is, and his staff to just basically be better than Pete's guys, which it can be right. That's why you hire him. But, Usually what you see is like a complete teardown, maybe some more veteran contracts shed. They got rid of some, pretty much all the ones we probably all expected, Brian Monet, Quandre, Jamal, uh, this. But it doesn't necessarily feel like a new team necessarily. There's new names, but it doesn't feel like a new team. Yeah, they're asking Mike to yeah go out there and just outcoach what Pete and his guys were doing almost right away, which is pretty ballsy. When you think about it, because, you know, even Pete, as good as he is as a coach, came in and didn't have a winning record. And I, that, that roster was pretty bare. That was that was different. That's why they just made 300 transactions or whatever. Um, but also what was very important, and I knew this was going to be the case, and I tried to caution people against this the best I could. I knew the free agency strategy wouldn't change. I knew that having a lot of money was not going to result in high spending. And that's been the case for a while, which is why in the past I was pretty critical of some uh um, Seattle's moves. This was before knowing some of the behind the scenes stuff, but like getting rid of Sherm, uh, trading Mike B, uh, like some of these moves I didn't like in real time because I was like, yeah, you're going to save money. But what are you going to do with that money? Go find, go pay Luke Jokel, go pay Eddie Lacey. You know what I mean? Like, I think they saved $11 million cutting Sherm. What did they do with that $11 million they saved cutting Sherm? It's very similar to cutting Quandre right now. I think they saved 11 mil. But what'd you do with that 11 mil? Did you go get Tremaine Ingram and and Farrell Brown, you know, it's, I don't I don't want to diss those new guys, but it's to illustrate the point of like having 50 million dollars in effective space or whatever they started with is not going to result in John or his now former salary cap guy, Matt Thomas. Then I'm just going to go crazy. That was a philosophical uh, belief from the top down. That wasn't just a Pete thing. Pete wasn't a penny pincher. If you know anything about head coaches, usually those guys are just like, it ain't my money. You know, if you listen to Mike Holmgren <laughs> on the radio, he'll tell stories about this all the time of him going in there and be like, Matt, Matt Thomas, because they used to work together. He'd be like, Matt, I really want this guy. And he'd be like, Coach, no, we, this is why we can't do this and cash and cap. And, you know, Mike would tell him, Matt, it's not our money. Let's go. Come on, let's go get these guys. That's generally how coaches are, right? Because they're, they're, for the most part, short-term thinkers, right? They know they have a game soon. They need to win said game and then win every game after that. Whereas the front office can be like, look, we're kind of big picture spreadsheet for the next two years, clean books, all these things that if you're the D-line coach, I don't give a damn about trying to rush the passer tomorrow. Right. So, and I understood all of that. um, And I understand all of that now. And that's why I look at the roster now. I'm like, all right, I know John wants to win. I know that in his heart of hearts. Like, I really feel like, Getting rid of Pete um, in this offseason has led people to sell John short. He's not some robot who just did whatever Pete says, 
right? Like John has his own belief system and he's been spending the last like 10 years telling us how he formed it. Ron Wolf, the Packers working for the uh, then Redskins, like working for the Seahawks before this, you know, like he's been telling us this whole time how he's got this belief system financially in terms of roster construction. Like this is his baby as much as Pete, Pete's baby. Um, so you're keeping John and his belief system and his spending habits and his views on guards and centers and edge guys and people willing to take a chance on quarterbacks who lead the league in interceptions, like all of his belief system, you're keeping all that, keeping a lot of the same players. And then you're just swapping out this new guy who's never done this. So I'm look, and I'm looking at the roster. I'm like, I don't, I don't know how you guys feel, but I don't think the roster got better. It's a different, but I wouldn't call it necessarily better. Uh, I think the combination of, even if you think like Bobby was a net negative in coverage, um, I think the combination of Bobby and Jordan is better than the combination of Jerome and Tyrell, at least currently. I think the body of work is big for me uh, there. Tyrell was really good last year. Small sample, relatively speaking. I think he played as many snaps in his career as Bobby has just played last year. Right? To put that in, in perspective, I think Tyrell is at about nine something. Bobby played, played like a thousand last year on defense. So small sample on Tyrell. I like Jerome. Him and Jordan is probably one to one. That That's fine. Um, but I think from a talent perspective, you dropped a little bit at safety. Um, Jamal, when healthy, is a really good player. Now, when healthy is like the biggest caveat in the world, right? I understand. Um, but I think Quandre is still like a plus player. Um, he has a skill set, and I'm big on skill sets in terms of their replaceability. Uh, he has a skill set you're just not seeing. You, and you look at the roster, look at the guys they got. Kevon Wallace, Julian Love, even Kobe Bryant to an extent, and Rayshon Jenkins are all basically like, for Spider-Man memes, and right? they're all like line of scrimmage guys who push comes to shove. I can stick you back there on the wide side of the field. We could play a little bit of single high, like here and there situationally if we need to, but we're not going to live in that world because we can't, right? Because that's not really any of those guys strengths. Whereas Quandre, you could live in that world if you so choose. He gave you that flexibility. So getting rid of him, um, getting rid of Jamal, swapping those guys for the safeties they got, swapping those linebackers for the guys they got. I'm just like, yeah, I mean, this roster is different, um, but it's not necessarily, I don't think, built particularly on defense to win right now. And then, as you guys, I'm sure, have discussed, half these dudes are under, under contract next year. <laughs> Jerome, uh, Julian, Tyrell, uh, come on. Like, half these dudes, J Jaron Reed, Hankins, all these dudes are just up next year, too. So, I mean, the roster's in a very weird space to me. It's not necessarily set up on defense to, like, dominate now, nor is it necessarily set up to dominate in the future, you know, both cash and, like, roster setup. So, yeah, I think Mike and John have put themselves in a weird spot and a lot of pressures on Mike and his staff to hit this out of the park, like, right out of the gate. And you talked about it before that, like, internally in the building, it seems like there's a lot of pressure on Mike and his staff to get more out of what they had. And you and Chris had uh, Nick Baumgartner on your show. Mm -hmm. And I thought he made a really interesting point. Kind of took you guys, you guys kind of had that light bulb go off when he was talking about how similar it was when Mike went to Michigan and what he's taken over versus what he had now. Like, I thought that was a really interesting point. Like, what'd you make of him saying that Mike is coming into like a similar situation that he's going in with Pete? Yeah. You know, the interesting thing that Nick's, and along with that same conversation, we talked about um, Mike McDonald with Nick was that like he maximized guys. I think he mentioned Aiden Hutchinson uh, in that, that conversation too. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's actually really good. Like I'm really, you know, that's encouraging to hear. But at the same time, you know, I'm the, I guess if Pete Carroll was to hear our conversation, he'd be sitting there like, so you think I didn't get the best version of Byron Maxwell? You think I didn't get the best version of Cam Chancellor or whatever? You think I didn't maximize, you know, Big Red? You think I didn't max, you know, like he could probably go down the list of, all, you know, J.R. Sweezy's and, you know, or I don't know how involved Pete was with the linemen. But you guys get the point. Like Pete would probably sit there and be like, "Guys, I I I picked up Brandon Brown out of the CFL. He <laughs> went to the Pro Bowl his first year, led the league in PBUs, I think. You know that year. So like on the flip side, while that sounded great with Nick, and I don't think he's wrong, he's 100 percent right that Mike can come in here and maximize some guys. Same same vein. The previous guy did that too. You know, like it is a plenty plenty of examples. Can I jump of him in? Doing Sorry well. to interrupt, Mike. Do you no, think go ahead, go ahead. that Pete? Do you think you have examples of Pete doing that in the last three to five years? That's a good question. I think you have, yes. I think he got the best version that anybody would, could have got out of Reek in year one. 
Now, year two, I guess maybe he just lost that goodwill. Um, but what you got at a reek in year one, I don't think you probably would have got anywhere else. Maybe if he goes to Baltimore, because um, Baltimore, you see what Mike McDonald has done. Um, Spoon, moving him inside was not something a lot of teams were floating. Like that was something that required some vision uh, to do as well. Uh, got the best years. Now they weren't like great years, but got like really great years out of DJ Reed when people didn't think he could play on the outside. He goes and gets 30 mil or whatever he got from Expensing the Jets. a pattern here. Uh, yeah, I guess they're all cornerback, DBs. Cornerback, cornerback, cornerback. Yeah, all DBs. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I guess that's probably that's probably the answer. Is like, yeah, yes, and they're mostly all DBs. Trey Brown and Mike Jack. Uh, you could say about Geno, you know, like Geno's best years were under Pete Carroll. Um, some of Russ's best years in the last five years were under Pete Carroll. So there's a little bit of QB, a little bit of CB. I'm not sure I buy that Pete Carroll is the quarterback amplifier that, that has now become a little bit of a uh, uh, a narrative out there since the Russell move and the Geno change. But I think it's a, it's a fair point. Uh, and this is coming from someone who's been a big fan of Pete, you know, the whole time, other than I, I personally thought it was very much time to change. Like you, you only get so many chances to field one of the 10 worst defenses in the NFL as a defensive <laughs> coach That's when true. you get multiple first round picks, multiple free agent passes, multi like you can't yeah. just keep being one of the 10 off, often one of the five worst defenses in the NFL. Very and true. you can't say, Hey, we know we got to get better in the trenches. We got to be able to stop the run and then come back and be one of the worst teams in the NFL and doing those two things. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I think one of the interesting pieces here is this is the year that John Schneider gets to have his own stamp, so to speak, so to say, and we can start to separate out just like when Russell moved to Denver and you can kind of start to see what was Pete, what was Russ, right? Mm -hmm. You can now see a little bit more of like where they actually helped each other and where they, they hurt each other. Now with John, how many of the moves in the past were, were John? Like for me, I don't think John's drafting a running back back to back years in the second round. If it's just John Schneider, and if you look back at who he came from, his lineage, Green Bay, I looked at his past in one of my shows past week. They never drafted running backs in the first few rounds. Like it was very rare. So I don't think hit, but wide receivers, which is the number one position John Schneider has drafted in his time here in Seattle, 17 wide receivers he has taken. That is absolutely something you can tie back to what Green Bay was doing and where he came up. They were always taking receivers, whether it was James Jones, whether it was uh, Jordy Nelson. Those were always second round kind of guys that they were investing in. So I, I think we're going to start to see those tendencies. And one of them, one of them, that's just a glaring omission for this offseason. And what was the number one priority for us on this podcast going into the free agency is interior offensive line. And John's been pretty vocal and a little bit of bravado about it. Like those guys get overpaid and they're overdrafted. I'm going to show you that it doesn't matter. And now we got rumors. Greg Van Roten, maybe he's coming in for a visit like in Tomlinson, maybe Cody Whitehair. Do you believe that they will stop at that and then maybe use a third, fourth, fifth round pick on another rookie? Or do you think there's potential that for the first time in John Schneider's career in Seattle, he will spend a day one pick on an interior offensive lineman? James Carpenter does not count. He's drafted as a right tackle. You know, Jermaine Fetty does not count. He was definitely expected to be a tackle. So this would be the first time that they spent it on an interior offensive line. Do you think that's a possibility this year? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um yeah, the, uh, also a funny thing that's kind of tied to that is John saying that, what he said about the uh, offensive interior line, talking about how they're overpaid, uh, get overdrafted. The same time Aaron Donald retires, and then there's like all of his highlights, not all of them, but like you guys have seen these, these clips of Aaron Donald. <laughs> I know where you're going. Half of them are him sacking Russ and blowing <laughs> yeah. through interior yeah. offensive linemen. I, I think Shit. someone put out a chart. I think Russ is the quarterback he sacked the most. In his yes. career, I don't have the I don't have the number, but yeah, it's got to be. And you look at some of his highlight tapes, and people are shouting him out, and it's like, yeah, Russ is on his butt half these clips, and, and it, it, so I, I I got a chuckle out of that. I was like, yeah, John, it's like there's probably something to <laughs> your guy getting wrecked by Aaron Donald versus you know you not really wanting to invest heavily in the in interior offensive lineman. But yeah, I, I think he could. I do think, and this was articulated to me last year. 
um, on, on a few occasions that like their their past, like for example, they hadn't taken an outside corner higher than what ninety, I think, before Shaquille Griffin. Well, yes, yeah, Shaquille Griffin was the highest, yep. and then Spoon was the the new highest. And I remember yep. being told multiple times, like, it's not that Pete doesn't think there's first round corners, right? He just doesn't feel like they they fell to him, right? He doesn't have some like hard and fast rule on. I can't take a corner higher than insert pick here. Um, and John's pretty similar. It's not that he won't take insert pick here. It just has to be a guy to really move the needle for him or to be there to be some advantage um, that maybe didn't exist before. I th- like one thing, I, uh, this is not like breaking news, but like remember when the Bengals where it was like, do they take a tackle to help Joe or take like a receiver or whatever? And I, th- I think this is the year they take Chase. Yeah, it was and Sewell like, and Chase. Yeah, and like I, at the time, I was on the t- take the tackle um, train, and they probably still should have done that. However, in that case, of extenuating circumstance of that particular receiver, I think, because he already had that with Joe, you know. And I think that if there's like that's just an example of a circumstance that could maybe deviate um, from tendency. In this instance, guys who played at Michigan, guys who played at Washington, um, perhaps so uh, Fontenot, let's say. Yeah, John's not big on, you know, taking guards that high. But if he's getting this guy who can also play tackle, who also is going to hit the ground running because he played for Grubb, also going to hit the ground running because he played for Scott Huff, does that get him the bump necessary to deviate from that? I think it would take something like that perhaps uh, to get John to pivot from his kind of philosophy. But I don't think all of the rules are hard and fast for John, nor nor were they for Pete. They They were pliable. Um, they were flexible uh, when the right prospect fell to them. They had things that they were looking for. Um, and I think for a while there, and you guys have seen this in some of their picks, from like 2013 to about 16, I feel like they were chasing replacements for specific dudes. It was like, all right, Michael Bennett's yeah. old. Let's find another five tech who can play three. You know, let's just keep doing that until we, until we find one. They just kind of never did. Um, you know, Cam's or Sherm retired out of his mouth, so let's find long, tall, long corners to try to replace them, right? So they, you could just see kind of that 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 archetype that they were chasing, and, and it just never worked. You know, every little shifty dude isn't Doug. You know, maybe it took them failing a couple times to figure that out. Maybe you know, every tall, long corner with dreads and an attitude and a personality is not Sherm, right? Like it just it, it took a little while, I think, and recently I think they've gotten back to just like. Let's just take take the guys we like, take the guys we like at the positions that we see value in. Now I don't know what happened in 2019, but like you, <laughs> I can I, I feel like John the light bulb kind of came on. He talked about it in one of his interviews too recently. But like the light bulb has come on and yes. like we were screwing up. I don't know if we can cuss on here, but like we were screwing up and before oh, we can nice. All right, we were fucking up uh, uh, before, and we've got to fix it. I know John. He'll never say I'm on the air. I know there's some picks where he's looking back like, yep, I messed that one up. I messed that one up. Shouldn't have listened to that position coach to take that guy. Shouldn't have let this scout stand on the table and take that guy. Shouldn't have listened to Pete here. Oh. John probably pointing to figure out himself. And he knows which ones those are. He's hinted at them before with us. You just got to really read the tea leaves on some of them. But he knows that. And you can see kind of the light bulb has, has come on. So, yeah, I do think if the circumstances are right, to pivot back to your actual question, but yeah, he would de- deviate from some of the stuff he's done in the past and and take a guard or whatever, an interior guy, a center, if he felt like it was the right guy. It's going to be, I think what some of the tendencies we've seen with John um, are that in the past, he has talked about how he overdrafted for need and he's tried to adjust for that as a mistake. He also still talks about shelves of players. And so he's always been hyper aware of where there's depth in the draft and that, in my opinion, he has overemphasized even that concept to where he's like, all right, I've got it. There's only one defensive lineman at this top shelf. We're going to take him now because there's not going to be one later. That's where you get an LJ Collier pick. You know, he might say that was a need, but I think a lot of times like he that was the, the closest to a top tier guy in their estimation at that time. And they make the pick instead of taking a best player available. And I think in the interior offensive line, that could definitely be the case this year where there's lots of guys. And they might just feel like we can wait and wait and wait in that case to get an interior offensive line as opposed to, in this case, doing the opposite of what I just said, which is take the best of a very good class 
and set yourself up with a blue chip level player instead of what, if you look at this roster right now, and I did this, uh, I think it was yesterday morning, I did positional rankings for each position group on the Seahawks roster, wide receivers, running backs, quarterbacks, one through N, not relative to other teams in the NFL, but just within the Seahawks. And guys, I got to tell you, it was a little depressing because <laughs> after cornerback and wide receiver and maybe running back, I could still rank the rest of them. None of the rest of those position groups are above average for the NFL. I don't think I would. The defensive line group is Leonard Williams and some OK players. I think that the edge group has some young guys and has potential, but I don't know that, you know, any of the, none of those guys are blue chip players. None of those guys are commanding double teams. Maybe it's slightly above average. Tight ends, certainly not. You know, offensive line, 100% not. Um, linebacker, you know, not. And so you don't build a great team with average position groups, even if you have good coaches. And... Guys that are, to your point, Mike, that are on one-year deals that aren't going to be around. So you're like, there's not the case to be made right now that there's this, people want to say these last two drafts, we just need to like grow those guys. And that's that's how this team becomes a contender. Jeff, you know, you know, I've talked about it. I don't think that's anywhere near enough. And I think that's what Mike's point was in his article. They don't need to have like a good draft. They need to draft at least one blue chip player, at least mm -hmm. one like Devin Witherspoon is level guy, like that kind of impact guy. They can't leave this draft without one or, or they're just, they're in real trouble. Yeah. I think their, their roster has a bunch of guys who are good at stuff. I, I yeah. can't remember me and, me and Chris on, a, on our Seahawks pod talked about this, I think a few weeks ago, which is like, fine. Like that, that's cool. The, the, the Legion of boom era team had a bunch of guys who really look at it they were just good at stuff you know but i also had a bunch of dudes who were elite at a thing mm -hmm. and right now uh I, I'm, I'm higher on the d-line group i think the most like the interior i'm really high i think draymond because having him like play outside backer for like half the year i was like really a disservice to him it reminded me of like how they had benson mayo playing it was just like this is just not it's not what he this is not how benson lasted 10 years in the league you know, dropping into where, you know, he's got to cover like Najee Harris or something. It just wasn't, wasn't his bag. It just wasn't his thing. So like, I'm still high on Draymond. If you don't move him, I think Jay Reed had a really good year last year. I'm, I'm really high on Jay Reed uh, and Leonard as well. Just like, like you said, those are all good, good players. Um, but yeah, I think you need more guys who have a superpower. That's why I'm still high on Reek. Cause I think when you've got a guy who has a superpower, yep. like it's, it is, you can do stuff with, with that. And he becomes a guy that the other team, has to worry about. And I think what I've done like in the last month or so um, is view the Seahawks roster in the context of like, if I was Sean McVay or Kyle Shanahan, like how would I view the Seahawks roster? Like, am I worried about anybody? Um, and right now, like if I'm Kyle, I'm like, eh, okay, I got to be careful throwing at 27, uh, I guess, you know, we really got to watch out for uh, 21. Like, we should run away from his side. Uh, we got a double 99 for sure. And then after that, it's like, mm, I can probably scheme up something to get to get by these guys. Um, and before and right now, I've been watching and people can probably tell from my Twitter. I've been watching a lot of old Legion of Boom games. That's why I've been like randomly tweeting like Cam Chancellor clips from 2011. Um, looking back at those teams, there wasn't shit you could do. Like those teams, you sit there and you're like, all right, we got to avoid 54, 29. 31, 25, we should we should probably slide our protection to 56. Okay, we can't run a screen to 50 side. Fuck. You know, then, then you just – it was very tough <laughs> at that point to score unless then your offense had, you know, blue chip players, or Calvin Johnson's or Tom Brady, stuff like that. There was guys who could move the ball on them, Julio Jones. Um, but for the most part, as an offensive coordinator, you definitely sat there and you were like, yo, this is going to be a tough day. Not to say we can't do it. They just have so many dudes that we got to put a different colored uniform on during the, during the scout week. And right now, I don't know how many guys the Seahawks have that you got to do that. You have to do that. That's it. I don't have any good players. There are plenty of good players, but like when I'm talking like a superpower. 
I mean like Debo Samuel's contact balance and breakaway speed. You know, it's like yeah. his superpower. Christian McCaffrey's vision and breakaway speed. You know, uh, on the Seahawks, you talk about reek speed and ball tracking. You know, he's incredible. I was the other night. This is a little bit of a tangent, but I just want to show Reek some love on this. I was rewatching the 2012 Atlanta loss, and remember the ball Roddy catches on uh, on Sherm, right? And it's it's because he's Roddy is open because Sherm thought he'd had Cam's help. Cam bit on a pump fake, and he was just nowhere to be found. Roddy ran right by him. So that same thing happens against the Chiefs in 2022. I think it's Jonathan Abram just comes flying the wrong way, and Reek turns and looks. And he's like, oh, shit, I'm beat because my safety's not there. He has the speed to catch, I think, like uh, number 84 for the Chiefs, breaks up the ball in the end zone. Incredible play. That's a superpower. Like, it's legitimately a play that Sherm, like, did not make in his prime because he didn't have the, the, the 4-2 speed. Uh, Reek has a superpower. Spoon has like four of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's just it's just nuts. Um, and even Abe Lucas for his superpowers in terms of tackles. Abe's a great tackle. When Abe gets screwed, like when his feet are off or he loses loses the battle up front, like his recovery is crazy. Superpower. Ken Walker, superpower. His agility and then breakaway speed. Like they have him just need more because you know what the Rams and the Niners have is guys with superpowers, and their coach is one of them. That's the other part. Um, so yeah, when I look at the roster of like this last month or so, that's really how I've kind of get on the pessimistic side because I'm looking at them like, you know, ain't no, Sean ain't worried about this. You know, Kyle not worried about this. And if those guys, if you can't win your division, that's how people, you know, end up getting fired, you know. So, yeah, I, I'm entering this a little bit like you, Brian, on the pessimistic side, mostly if you view it from the lens of the division rivals. Yeah, and it's, it's funny. That's exactly how we looked at it going into last year. And so many guys – we thought would take step forwards. A lot of them regressed. So that's where me and Brian have been in this kind of debate with the draft where they don't have these superpower guys, but they also don't have a second round pick and they gave away one of their third round picks. So we're conflicted. Like, do they stay at 16 and take that superpower guy or do they need to move out and try to get more ammo to how to hope on the hit of those guys later? We've been battling back and forth on that. (laughs) Where's your head on that one? Yeah, so in that, the, uh, I just did a mock that came out today, um, and I'm working on another piece where I'm looking at some tradeback scenarios. And the more I do these mocks and tradebacks, I feel like there's no way you stay at 16. You just can't. This feels like a year to have. This feels very similar to – there may not be the depth of talent, but you guys will get where I'm going with this. The 2017 draft was pretty freaking loaded. When you look back, oh, it's like it all starts for every team. Us. Yeah, like for every team, and it was the it yeah. was such it's such a letdown for Seattle, obviously because they had so many swings and misses. Ugh. But like they, they, the process was fine. I thought like they started with I think pick twenty six and was like mm, back, back of this three draft. times. Dr- back of this draft is like, mm, but let's load up and we could still get a like if they had traded back I think to thirty and like t- picked up a, the pick that became like Ram checker mm, came uh, Chris Carson I think was one of their trade back picks. I think uh, like Leno or Tedrick was one of their picks. Like if you trade mm-hmm. back and then you picked up like Tedrick and Chris Carson, and then you got Buddha. Right. You know I mean, that had been good process. You know what I mean? Or even, uh, yeah, the, the tackle that went to the Saints. Or I think TJ Watts back there. But like 26 was not the spot to take. Like, all right, let's move back. Because on day two and three of this draft, there are some shots. I think they took like six dudes in the yeah. top, like 112 or something. They had a lot of swings at the apple in a year that there was a lot of that was the time to have bites at the apple. I feel very similar about this draft. I'm not super high after like pick 12, unless you need a court. Like if you need a quarterback, totally different discussion, but for the non quarterback teams after like pick 12 or 13, I'm like, yeah, um, in this draft. And then for the position that the Seahawks need after like the top two guys, I'm like, yeah, we can just go back and just take a bunch of swings. Like this is the draft. I think I'd rather have, Four picks on like day two, then you know, just that one pick, you know, as you potentially get that blue chip guy in, in the first round. Cause I think if you want a safety, you don't need him with 16. You can get, you know, I'm a kook, so you can get Jaden Hicks, you know, second round. You know, you can, if you need D line, go get Tavondre Sweat in the second round, go get Chris Jenkins in the second round. You want some backers, go get Junior Colson in the second round. Like, it's like all of these guys you feel like if you just had a bunch of random picks in the second and third round, they could really clean up. Now, some of them are going to miss. Of course, you're going to draft some dudes and they're, they're Amara Darbo, right? It just happens. But when you take so many swings, you, you, you're all right. 
Like one of them was Amara, one of them was Shaquille, who made the Pro Bowl. Like one of them's Leno, one of them's Ethan, who's like a starting caliber, Ethan Posick, a starting caliber center. So yeah, I think this is the year to to have that, right? So yeah, the more I do these trade back scenarios, I'm like, I did one last night, or actually not last night, it was this morning before I hopped on with you guys. I was like, man, I got all the way to like pick 39, I think, from like Carolina before I made a pick. Um, and I felt good about it. I, I forget who I took, but I loaded up and I ended up filling a lot of a lot of needs because in my mind, I know some of these guys are not going to hit. Everyone wants to think on draft night, John comes in and he says the same joke about the surgeon saying the surgery went great. Same thing every time. He needs a new joke. But the reality is, take eight guys, six of them might suck. But if those two guys are nice, if those two guys are Ty Lockett and Frank Clark, you know, then then your uh, your draft goes a little better. That was still a bad draft, but you guys, you guys get. Uh, it. It's interesting you say that. I, I think when you come out of a draft with two Pro Bowl quality players, I think it's a good draft period. Like, uh, you know, I, I think people for a long time were like, "Hey, Schneider hasn't had a good draft for all these years," and I was like, "No, I think that was a good draft. You had two Pro Bowl caliber players at premium positions." Uh, yes, there were some other misses, uh, but I think if you look at Jeff, you've talked about this, you know, Jeff kind of talks me off the ledge sometimes. Um, and, and I'm like talking to him about the state of the roster and he's like, well, but you know, it's like Detroit, you know, you need to be able to kind of have a few drafts in a row where you've got some depth. If you look at that 2017 draft, what team completely remade themselves. And then the new Orleans saints, and they didn't do it with one pick. Mm -hmm. They did it with like three or four picks. Look back to last year with the Rams. The Rams were nowhere. The Rams, it wasn't their first pick that that defined their change of complexion of their roster. It was the fact that they hit on three plus guys, some of them in late rounds, that all look like they can be Pro Bowl or borderline Pro Bowl level players. And so it absolutely needs to be a draft where even last year for the Seahawks, like if Anthony Bradford had been the quality of guard that Puka Nakua is of receiver, we'd be having a totally different conversation about this team. But he wasn't that level of guard, and they haven't been able to have enough of those. There hasn't been the KJ Wright in the fourth round. There has there was the Tariq Woolen in the fifth round, right? But there mm -hmm. has not been, you know, there has not been the safety picked. When's the last time the Seahawks drafted a safety? That was great. I went back and looked at this. They have not taken many safeties because they went from Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor, who they drafted both in their first draft, mm -hmm. to then going to Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs and really never deciding that safety was a position they needed to upgrade. And now, like, I don't know if we know. Like, I, I mean, I, is it okay if I reveal who you selected? Uh, let me ask you if you're if, if you'd be revealed. Oh, what took in the mock? In the mock, yeah, 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 you, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Who did you have the Seahawks taking after trading back in the first round in your mock? Yeah, I had him taking Cooper DeJean from uh, Iowa um, because I feel like he is of the spoon-ish ilk in terms of if you just put him on the field, he's gonna make shit happen. And that is like what we were talking about before with like superpowers. That's what that's what you need. Um, get a guy who whether you put him at nickel, corner, or safety. Um, I would probably try him at nickel, but either way, you just put him on the field. I know he's going to make shit shake. Uh, so I, I know I, I looked at like the comment section on my uh, my article like at like nine this morning, and I like, read the first two, and I was like, yeah, I'm about to go back to bed. Um, I'll review this later, but I just feel I feel good about it. Um, also because I know I've gotten a really good feel for what Mike McDonald is kind of looking for uh, right now as well, and like yeah, he would. I don't this would be an unfair comparison totally because this guy's a rookie hasn't played any snaps yet. But like if you if you're a Seahawks fan and you like what uh Mike McDonald was able to do with Kyle Hamilton, then you'll probably like what he's able to do with Cooper. That's like kind of my my thought process with that. I'm so disappointed that Nathan Ernst couldn't make the show tonight because uh Nathan and a couple of the guys on our pod, I, I just want you to know, Mike. I brought up Cooper DeJean, DeJean as an option for the Seahawks. I'm like, I think look at what Mike McDonald, his first pick, like when he was first time in Baltimore, uh, first pick taken was Kyle Hamilton. Now, I'm not saying Cooper DeJean is Kyle Hamilton, but safety is an important position for them. Uh, who are players that they've spent on that have played big roles? Who was, who was John Schneider's first pick outside of Russell Okung? Mm -hmm. It was a safety. 
you look at that position group, you've got to your point, you got one guy who's on the final year of his deal, another guy that's on a two year deal, and Rayshon Jenkins, who's 30 years old. There's no one on the safety position on this roster that they're like, ah, we can't have this guy's snap stolen by somebody. Like, it's absolutely a, an unspoken gap by most people and a position that they might choose to, to prioritize. But let me show you. I got to do this for you. This is what happened. So I brought this up. And then the guys said, wait a second. Is this who you're talking about? <laughs> two, two of the guys lost it. And they show this picture. This picture by itself has killed this yeah. man's draft uh, value <laughs> in our group chat. Like anytime you bring him up, they're like, no way. I, we're not drafting this guy. That dude's, that dude's nice, man. Also, the, the, whether it's Cooper or another guy, I think what's important about DB is, and I, okay, this is how I'll do this. If you're not going to have the talent advantage, then you need to have the schematic advantage. It's generally how football goes on the other side of the ball. On defense, to have the schematic advantage, you need the element of surprise. Or, you know, like the offense needs to not be able to figure out who the what who's doing what. Is that guy the mic? Is he the is he the nickel on this? Is he coming down from the safety spot? Is he rotating up, you know, in Tampa 2 or whatever? And to do that, you need dudes who can, in theory, do a bunch of different shit. Right? And I think that is if like the most optimistic view of the defense is to view it that way. Mm -hmm. Um and to do to be really good at that, I think you got to add some more guys. I think they need multiple DBs um, to do that, and probably some new linebackers too. But like right now, if you put Spoon, Kavon Wallace, Rayshon Jenkins, and Julian Love uh, all on the field together, you don't really know who's going to be the deep safety if they disguise the right look. You don't know who's going to rotate, who's going to be our slot guy in this like look right here. Who's blitzing? Um, who's doing what? Like who's carrying the number two? Like who's doing all this different stuff? Like Tariq, you kind of got a feel for what he's about to do, but like those other guys, even if they're all not like the fastest or the strongest and have the best ball skills, if it's third and seven and you don't know what we're about to do, well, we have the schematic advantage unless you like have Mahomes, right? So, um, and there's no Mahomes in the NFC, so you're fine if you're trying to get to the Super Bowl. So that is like the optimistic view, and that's what the thought process that kind of led me to a guy like Cooper as well. You can put him wherever you put him in spoon. And Rayshon and Julian Love on the field, you know, okay, well, who's doing what? You know, because that's that's how coordinators operate. They look at your personnel groupings and your tendencies and all that. And that's a that's an issue Seattle had last year. By like week six, everyone knew what they were doing. They knew if it was first in this, doing that. Second and short, nickel pressure. Third in this, doing that. Like it was figured out very fast. And you could see it in the numbers. After the bye week, they were a completely different team. Um, mostly after like Cincinnati, a completely different team. So to avoid that, you need guys who, all right, he's the strong safety within it on film from their week two game. Now I look at the week six film and I'm like, hmm, well, now he's playing to the far side. Now he's in the boundary, blah, blah, blah. And it just kind of throws stuff up, you know, it mixes everything up. And that's exactly what happened to the Seahawks when they played the Ravens. They had no idea what the Ravens were doing. Every that was the worst third down performance I think of. Maybe not ever, because I think I covered a game where they literally didn't convert a third down. And they were, <laughs> Feels like there was a lot of this. <laughs> I think I think they didn't do it. They actually won the game that they didn't do it. Pretty sure it was against the Cardinals in 2018. I have to fact check that, but I'm pretty sure it was at Arizona. And they won. I think they were like 0 for 10. But either way, in the Ravens game, they were like 1 for 10. Probably some of the worst third down performance I've ever seen. Like to do that, it's not just that they had Roquan or Brandon Stevens or whatever, or Marcus. They they confused the shit out of the Seahawks from the front to back. They messed up all the protections, plans, guys weren't executing, but also it was like, who's coming from where? Um, and I think to achieve that, you need an influx of like versatile defense, not just good guys. Like there's one guy I took in my mock. It was like Cam Hart from Notre Dame. He's like a good like corner, probably be a solid guy, but he's like 6'2", 212, long arms. Like he's clearly just going to be on the outside. Cooper, do whatever the hell you want. So that's how I ended up uh, on that pick. It's more schematic to really unlock this what mike mcdonald's trying to do mike can we torture you with uh, a live mock get your opinion on some players right now yeah yeah sure you good for that it depends i don't have a ton of insight on everybody so it just you don't have to you don't have to yeah. and it, you you are free we will kind of like 
we will guide you through this, but it's a good way I've found to kind of have a conversation about some of these players and some of the options for Seattle. Um, so let me go ahead and do this. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and Jeff, uh, let's talk. I've already started it. So oh, you can kind of see, on. you can already see who, and for folks who have been watching us do this, I tried to delete the ads ahead of time. So we'll see if I actually did it this time, those pesky ads. And I do want to give a shout out to Kent Lee Platty over uh, at Math Bomb on Twitter, who was my guest this morning and the creator of the RAS Relative Athletic Score Framework. He also is responsible for this mock draft simulator for Pro Football Network. Oh, so uh, shout out to Kent yeah, Lee either. Platty. Um, so here's what they got. Um, relatively logical pieces here. Jeff, did you say something? Did I miss something you said? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Not so similar. Amarius Mims goes a little higher than maybe some people are projecting, but Jeff, you talked about it with, with the Ramchick, uh, injury and news seems like tackles probably a likely selection for the same. Yeah, they're going to take a tackle. And what's interesting here. And Jeff, I'm going to go to you first and then I'm going to go to Mike second. A few things have changed last time we talked. So, you know, there's there's the guy that Cooper DeJean that that uh, Mike talked about and mocked to him today. Michael Penix Jr. is 34 on this. I think there's zero chance he is going in the second round. I think there's zero chance he's going after the Seahawks pick. I think he's a top 15, potentially a top 12 player in this draft. I think other people are starting to feel that way as well. There's some conversation that the Seahawks could take that uh, Rob Rang, who is going to be on the show Friday morning, who I have a ton of respect for as a draft analyst. He said he thinks that the Seahawks would be thrilled. He's a dream scenario is that Michael Penix Jr. is there at 16. He does not think he's going to make it that far. Do you believe that the Seahawks would turn in that card for Michael Penix if he was there at 16? This oh, to you, do Jeff. I believe that? Oh, no. oh. Talk to you, Jeff, I'm, I'm and then turn to you, Mike. I don't. I don't have that feeling. and Maybe I'm wrong because if they really want a quarterback, they've given away a lot of their ammo. And just if you really want a quarterback, hoping he just falls to 16, seems like a pretty stupid strategy. So all <laughs> their moves seem to indicate that they don't want a quarterback, especially getting Howell and then your John's comment on the radio that like they looked in front of them and every one of those teams needed a quarterback. If you really wanted to get this guy, you could have made a move. So if their dream scenario is just sit at 16 and wait, that seems pretty stupid. So all evidence seems to point against it, but there has been some buzz lately. So maybe I'm wrong, but I don't get that sense. Mike, my my thought there, because I think Jeff's generally right, is I don't think they said that they don't want him. I think that they realize that there's enough teams ahead of them that do want a quarterback that they'd have to move up. They don't have a second round pick. The third round pick was not going to be sufficient to do it. And so they've kind of like covered their bases a little bit. That doesn't mean that if they're wrong, if there's what they call what is a, an upset where where someone falls to them, that they wouldn't necessarily do it. Do you think there is a chance that the Seahawks would take Michael Penix Jr. if he falls or, or maybe another quarterback that they love if falls to them at 16? I would be very, very surprised if they took a a, a quarterback at 16. Um, I think, honestly, I'm not even sure if these guys were even paying as much attention to the quarterbacks before Drew left. Like, I think that that was that was really, I think, the starting point of like, oh, you need another quarterback. I think at that point, if they were they were comfortable with running it back with Geno, having Drew back him up, um, because yeah, I mean, look at the you look in front of you. I don't even know. We got to get four quarterbacks in the top four picks. The first four picks might be quarterbacks. And if that's the case, you're sitting there 16 and you want a guy. Yeah, you don't. You can sit there and hope that he gets there. But I really think that quarterback wasn't on their mind in that way until until Drew left for the Giants. And then it was like, hmm, all right, but maybe maybe Bo Nix could be our developmental guy. Maybe Michael Penix could be our developmental guy. Because I do think John wants that. He's like, if, if he's cool with Geno being 33 or 34 or whatever, but get a young dude to balance this out because it's just such a great asset um, with the Ricky scale and everything. So yeah, I think now that you got Sam 
And John reminds us at every turn that like Sam's the same age as Penix, same age as Jaden Daniels, younger than Bo Nix, same age as I think the Tulane kid. Um, so in John's mind, he's getting a seasoned, cheap version of what he could get, you know, uh, to for some of these guys to be like Gino's developmental backup. Yep. Yep. I think that's probably right. I, I think it's an interesting piece for us to watch. Uh, so I'm going to give this decision to Mike and I know what he's going to do because he's already foreshadowed it. He wants to move back. Jeff, once again, every week, I'm going to be asking you this. If, if this is how it falls and these guys are available, you got verse, you got Fautanu, you got Byron Murphy, you got, you know, whoever's on your list. Is there any of these guys that you're sticking and picking for? Or are you team trade back right now? I think there's enough numbers where you should probably trade back, but I think the one guy I'd still stick and pick is Fautanu. I just think Fautanu is the perfect fit for everything they need to, to hedge Lucas. To, he can play in the interior. He knows the coaches, but if you look at just the numbers here and first Fautanu, Murphy, uh, Barden, some of the guys, I think you kind of have to drop down here. I am also, as of right now, I've vacillated back and forth. I am team trade back. And, and for me, the reason I'm team trade back is different maybe than, than Mike or, or maybe you, Jeff. I don't know. I'm team trade back because I now have a defensive tackle, couple of defensive tackles I would be thrilled to get in the second round. And there's an offensive interior offensive lineman I would love to get in the first round that I still think you can get if you trade back. And that is now my current dream draft. We'll see what happens here. We'll see what Mike chooses. So let me tell you, Mike, the trade offers you got. Uh, Dolphins are offering 21 and 55. Um, so this would get you into the second round for your one of your I think fourth round picks and 16. That's one offer. The other, that's the only offer. Um, we mm -hmm. could. We're not going to propose trades. It takes too long. Are you right. taking this deal? Yeah, yeah, I take that. I, I would too. Yeah, yeah, I would too. That. Done. So we're not going to look at other trade offers from here, um, just to keep things moving along. Who went? Terry and Arnold went. Jared Verse went. Troy Fotano did go. Brian Thomas goes. J.C. Latham goes. A couple of those guys would be nice to have a Seahawks. They're not now. So now we're here. Um, who is your pick, Mike? Who is your pick? If at this point we're going to stick and pick, who are you going with? Yeah, see, I think this is why I would have been cool trading. I'm cool trading back is because yeah, I like so so many guys on the board, and I actually get I get good reps at these when we do like at the athletic our beat writer mock drafts because mm -hmm. real GMs and like we have real slack debates and like I got backdoored one year, had a deal in place, and then like went to go <laughs> accept it. And he accepted another deal with somebody. I forget what the specifics oh. of it, but I was pissed. It was like three years ago or something. I was like, dude, we had a deal. He was like, yeah, the Chargers came with a better one or whatever. All right, um, we're going to make an exception yeah. for you. We will let you look at these two trade offers. This is going to make your draft fantastic because I'm sure you're going to just load up here. So, so Carolina is offering you to move out of the first round to 33 and then to pick up the first pick of the third round. Uh, the Texans are offering you to move out of the first round all the way to pick 42, but you get two second round picks and you get a third round think, pick. I think one of those picks went to Buffalo today. So uh, <laughs> it's maybe it's not updated yet. That's no, okay. I think that's the 2025 one. No, no, no. Yeah. All the yeah, that's a future. That's a future. Yeah, yeah. That, went, that went there. I think are the, you that, taking either one of these? The, I think the pick that got moved in the Diggs deal is the one where like Minnesota oh, gave yeah, up yeah. to get yeah, yeah. the extra first round ammo they currently have. Um, I like both of these. Yeah, this is all enticing. I think I actually I like so in that Houston deal we have 42, 55, 59, 81, and 86. Yes. Yeah. We have five picks in the top 86. Yes. Uh in the Carolina, what go back to that for me? We have pick 33, 55, 65, and 81. So we got four. In the top 81. I think I like I like the Carolina deal. Let's take all right. We're doing it. this. You're moving out of the first round entirely. Yeah, I move out of the first this round. Deal. How do you feel about that, Jeff? I'd be a little nervous just because I need that quality, but man, they got a lot of picks in that sweet spot. Okay. So so make an exception for Mike, because Mike's exceptional. Well, and John Johnny Newton goes, which for me is fine. Cooper's gone, you know, Mike. Mike had him. Byron Murphy, a favorite for this show. Chop Robinson goes. Graham Barton, who is a new favorite for this show, 
gone. Uh, the Lions got him too. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they're drafting enough. Well, the Zeitler's on a one-year deal, so sure, sure, that could happen. I would personally be pretty upset if this is how things played out, um, meaning that I think that the guards that went are significantly better than the other players and the tackles I'd be okay with. But let's see how this plays out. First pick of the second round. Michael Pettis. Now where are you going, Mr. Mike? Yeah, this is actually, I'm not like a huge Penix guy, but at this point, he's great value. Um, but the problem is here, if he slid to 33, how much further will he slide? Like that at this point, so many teams have already passed on him. Um, and what sometimes we'll do in this, if there's a guy that you think there's no way he's going to be here, you kind of just ignore him and kind of pick more of who you think is uh, of the guys available here, who you think you'd actually go for. No, I'm, I'm, well, I'm with you guys at, uh, or at least you, Brian, and I don't think, I don't think Penix is going to fall to the second round maybe even if i think perhaps him and he and Bo and jj Brian maybe should i just don't there's just too many teams who are just in just, just enamored with the skill set so yeah. i'm currently I, lo- I actually love the oregon kid i love jackson uh i love jackson, jackson powers, powers johnson I, I, yeah I, lo- I think he's like you take him and he's your guy for like 10 years okay um, so is that your pick here Yes, yeah, I'll take. I'll take. All right, center guard option there, so he's gone, and so you got something on the interior line that would be great. Now we're here at fifty-five. What's your? Is there a position that you're looking at here? Is there a specific player? Absolutely, I take the kid from Kansas State. I wouldn't even hesitate at this point. Cooper Beebe. So you go, you double up on the interior offensive line. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Man. We need to make You're, Mike the GM, man. You can man after heart. I will say for me right here, Michael Hall Jr. is my pick. I, I, I think like, that, that would be my other one. Yeah. Hit, I good. love that kid. And if you get him here, I'd be thrilled. I'm a little sad to see, you know, Junior well, Colson's gone. We're up at 65, it, too. Is is sweat not is sweat already go? Sweat went. Where did sweat go? Oh, he yeah. went 34. See, that would be tough for me. I think I would have gone sweat first. Potentially, I feel like he's a little higher upside, but that's tough. Uh, Jeff, what would you do here? I would probably take one of Hall or Jenkins. Okay, but so we're taking BB. You know, I'm a BB guy, so this is. I know you are. I know you are. I love it. So, so we've got offensive line, offensive line, which would just have people buzzing. Uh, like, what is happening well, with the Seahawks front office right here? So now you got the first pick of the third round, thanks thanks to one of your trade backs. Now we're oh, he's still there, mm-hmm. that, and that's that is why I was comfortable taking uh, BB. I think B, BB has I think a very unique skill set, and like he's big as hell. Like he's he really like massive, but man, he can move still. He can move. He can get out and get the guys out of the way. So yeah, that's why I was like somebody's gonna somebody's gonna take that dude. Uh, yeah, I think we got Michael Hall. I like him. Not a huge Newbin guy. Like, I think if we go safety here, it would be my guy Hicks. Did Hicks go? Oh, did uh, Jaden Hicks from Washington State go? Uh, he did not. He's oh, still available. Wow. I like the uh, Wake Forest kid underneath him, too. So, where we at? We have 65 yeah. and then we have 81. So, 81's have, next. 81's next to the next 16. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not a big fan of this NC State backer. Uh, yeah, let's let's take let's take the Ohio State kid. Michael okay, Hall. man, beef, beef, beef. No one's gonna be asking where it is in your draft because it's all in the first three picks. So now we get to eighty-one. Interestingly, Cole Bishop, who's increasingly a guy, kind of matches your description, Mike, of a do-it-all kind of safety that could be an interesting fit for the Seahawks and Mike McDonald. Goes a couple picks before Brandon Dorless. A lot of folks are are interested in goes McKinley Jackson as a defensive tackle that's gotten some some love of late. So now you've got two interior offensive linemen and a interior defensive tackle. What are you looking at next here? This is also like a good example of we're just we're, we're that need has to be factored in because we passed on some like receivers I think who are probably better than some of the guys we took, mm-hmm. but like you mm-hmm. just can't you just can't do that. A like, best player available is a myth in that regard. Like purely, you have to factor in what you need to. Um, because I think we we passed on a few receivers that I was like, like the Georgia kid, love him. Yeah. Uh, love the Georgia kid. You got him. some good receivers looking at you in the face here with Ricky Pearsall, Jalen McMillan still on the board. 
Yeah, and all because right. I'm going to pass on all these guys, that's why I brought that up. Because, like, I'm going to pass on all these dudes, but that's because, like, I'm trying to the best I can win right away. Um, yep. Let's see. Oh, I don't so all like... the safeties are there now. Hicks is yeah, still that's... there. Yeah, we can probably wait on safety in this particular scenario. Let's take yep. – um... oh, actually, I like this Georgia kid. Let's take the Georgia kid, actually. Let's take Javon let's Bullard, take Bullard. Safety well, out of Georgia. I like Bullard. Yeah, I okay. like Bullard. What do you like about Bullard? I don't know if he's like to do it all, but what he can do, he good at it. <laughs> like I like I like that kid. Uh probably take a little bit because uh the safety classes doesn't seem super strong. Uh but I feel like if we we coach him up, I say we like him on the damn team, but yeah. hey, coach, coach hey, him up. you're drafting a man that you get to you get to pretend. Yeah, no, nah, yeah. If I, if I take the guy, my job, job's on the line. Uh yeah, I think he's gonna be able to make plays. I think uh it'll he'll probably have a at some point a year like Brian Branch just had where you just look up and you like chart his splash plays and you're like, wow, he just made a lot of plays. You yeah. know, like he would just like Brian had a ton. I think he let all rookies in splash plays last year. Brian Branch did. Yeah. Um, we were huge yeah. Brian Branch fans on this show pr prior to the to the draft. We were like, yeah, I, that I is a Ravens. Well. That is a Ravens player, man. Like even though he ended up in Detroit. Um, All right. So now you're here in the fourth round. You've still got picks 179, uh, uh, 192, and 235 after this. For what it's worth, I think there's 0.01% chance Mike Sanistril is available this late. That's I think he's a second Oh, that's the Michigan pick. kid? Yeah, that's Yeah, good. there's no way yeah, he's no available way. this late. I, I almost will not let you take him because it's going to make your draft <laughs> too cool. Well, um, the, the other thing is, like, I know I think in my mock, I didn't take a linebacker for a while. Um, mm -hmm. and it's just, so I'm not big, I, I, the LJ Collier type stuff that scares me, you yeah. know, like, I feel like if you don't like a position group, like you, for example, taking Gary Jennings and, um, John Arsua didn't satisfy the receiver hole that Doug left because he drafted receivers. You still had the hole cause they didn't pan out. So I'm not going to take a guy just cause he's, he's at the position I need. I want to take a guy who I think is going to be able to play at the position I need. It took three running backs the year Marshawn retired. I don't think any you, of them ended up panning out. You took this guy, Theo Johnson, in your mock, I believe, a little bit later. So I like him. Right? I like him. Where do we have? We have our pick 18. Or no, we have we have a pick 16. 179. Later. So there's a big, big gap after this. Oh, that's right. We gave up 118. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Uh oh, I like this. South Dakota guard too, but we already took guards. Uh exactly. yeah, let's take let's take Theo. Let's take Theo. Oh man. Th Theo. All right. He's crushing this draft. This is like, these are all guy, approved picks, good. aren't they, Jeff? Oh man, these, these are all some of our guys. The values all right. Like, he's good. He's good, yeah. man. He, he could be. be he's he can have some superpowers too. I think I think one of them could be like his contact balance. Like I feel like when guys are going to try to hit him, like it's third and six. Even if he runs a four yard route, it might still move the chains because that guy's not going to get him down. All right, before we we you know pat you on the back too much, you do not have a linebacker drafted not, yet yeah. i'm aware not yeah, drafted it's... any edge uh you could argue maybe like tackle out of this draft or you could you could double up on some of these other position groups is there anything like what what are you looking for at this point uh yeah this gets i was thinking about this when i was just uh doing my mock i don't really know how the new special teams rule with the kickoff mm -hmm. affects what type of guys I want. I don't know if people are going to be putting linemen up there or, or, or what I'm not, or like who's on the coverage unit. Cause speed becomes not as important. With, right. And it's like speed and pursuit. If the guys are like five yards or whatever from the guys. So I don't really know what to do on day three in that regard. Cause usually I'd be like, Oh, take a kid like Shaquem Griffin. I'm like, well, he can fly, he can hit. Right. It'll be fine on special teams if nothing else. Jarek Reed from New Mexico you know, last year was like the same thought, but now I'm like, well, does that even matter as much? Do I want big guys? Are we going to be running like trap plays up front with our kickoff block team? You know, because the guys are right. I, I legitimately, I don't know if the Seahawks know the answer to that. Yep. By the way, um, I'm not a big fan of Ohio State kid here. The backer, yeah, this yeah. is this is where it gets. This is where you're throwing darts. Uh, yep. This is where you are throwing darts. Hoping is there a position mistakes. you want me to show you who's available? Is like a position group? Yeah, let me see the receivers. Because in theory, it's such a deep class. Maybe I get some value in this point. But Jordan Whittington's interesting name. Uh, Anthony mm. Gould. I don't know how you feel about him. Interesting 
slot guy. Oh, that's there's a guy. There's a guy I took in my mock that I ended up liking. That Southeast Missouri State kid. Um, he just killed the killed the stuff at the Ryan combine. Flournoy. Yeah, he killed the stuff at the combine. Super fast. I think he was like two hundred something pounds. Ran like four. Oh yeah, look at that Raz oh, score. Man. Dang. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. No. It's, if you guys get some time, check check him. Like he didn't put up big numbers, but like he he could he could fly. Like he's really good athlete what does our edge class look like at this point all right let's look at defense edge gabriel murphy not uh, much left <laughs> not yes, a lot it's... left jalen Hale. Oh, they, they got my guy ron stone from wazoo grayson uh, that's it. yeah you want you want to you want to take a, a coog here well if i was going to take an edge i'd take brendan jackson did he already go i don't know if you can search guys in this uh i think he'll be look. at the top there yeah, he would. Yeah, yeah Brandon Jackson. Gone. Brandon Jackson went. Brandon uh, Jackson's uh, gone. We, we've we've no, drafted really, him quite a few times. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a really good player. Um, yeah, this is tough. See, now I might just take with something. I might throw a guy at the wall and see if it sticks. Take a backer. Uh, uh, yeah, see. it's really thin. It's I mean, well, it's it's Nathaniel Watt has thin. a thin visit. This is this is where I would actually. I'd probably trade back or double up. Uh, yeah. what, let's, Mike Barrett. Let's, what is Michael Let's, Barrett doing all the way down here? Yeah, he's gonna go a lot uh, higher than that. That's where's wild. that? Uh, where's that Washington backer? Um, I forget his name. Can oh, like uh, Yeah, I is think he he's already been taken. Jesus, this is this is some good GMs. All right, let's double up on DTs. Let's double up on DTs. Let's let's yeah, let's Christian get bigger. Boyd's in the trenches. Christian Boyd's a great pick. Is that who you're looking at? Yeah, yeah. Let's go with him. Christian Boyd done. Like you get him this late, that'd be great. So you got 192 and then 235. So okay, let's look at everyone right who's left. Yeah, I see what they're saying. There's not much left when you get here. Uh, yeah, at this point, now we now we can take a backer, just be just to take a backer, just to take one. All right. Yeah, just to see if it's at this at this particular juncture. I'm I'm all right with that. Um, I don't know see. any of these dudes. Steel Chambers, I know, but I don't like. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason uh, he's 400th. Who is yeah. at the top of this? Michael Barrett's still there at 600. Omar Spates. I see. So, oh my God, he's small. 225. I mean, that's, that's, that's how small guys are these days, though. Although the write up said he's 237. Yeah, that, um, I think just said he was rocked up. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Who, who knows? Let's, Accurate. Click on that Nebraska kid. Why does that sound familiar? Yeah, I don't know. No. I mean, not a good athletic profile. Let's take uh let's take the Mississippi State kid. Nathaniel Watson. Actually, that is a guy that I believe C Mike Spin move. Uh was it C Mike Spin move or was it? No, I think Rob? it was Rob. Rob. It was Rob Staten yeah. has has liked him. All right, final pick. Final pick. Oh, Ryman. Kip Ryman is sitting there. That is ridiculous. I'm not letting you take him, even though I'd love you to. Um, anyone here you did you want jumps uh, out to you? See. Oh, you got Dylan Johnson still there? Yeah, sure. I'll take Dylan. Dylan, done. Yeah, take Dylan. All right. All right. I, I think I think you're gonna like this. I mean, how do you feel about this draft? Uh Jeff Simmons, what, what grade would you give this draft? Be honest. I'd go with the B plus. Uh, I love the, the start of the draft. The two doubling up on the O line is it's just. It's, I like I like both players a lot too. BB's been my guy for really since I dove into. I, I love BB, man. I love BB. Me too. He just seems like a guy that, like no matter where he ends up, he's going to be a player. And he seems like a guy that Seattle will probably pass because they never take the right offensive lineman, <laughs> and we'll be left wondering like why didn't they take that guy? Like he just seems so projectable. Michael Hall, if you get him in the third round. Which I think you can. Yeah. If you get him in the third round, you really see the value of the trade backs. And I see what you're talking about. It's coming out of the draft with those three guys versus just one guy at 16. Like, man, you're look deep. The safety was really good value in the third. Like, you got good players for basically across the board. This reminds me of where the Seahawks are. And I think the Cowboys might have done this to the extreme. But remember the Cowboys defense was just Swiss cheese one year. I think it was 2020. They were just they were just awful. Dak had to throw for like 450 yards yeah. for him just to lose by three. Um, and he broke his leg, poor guy. Um, the next draft, they I think maybe they have 10 picks. I think like 
nine of them might have been defensive players. Like they were just like, our defense sucks. We're going to just draft as many defensive players as we can, see who sticks. I can't remember who stuck out of that, but I I believe – I just like the idea of like, yo, some of these guys are going to miss, but if we hit, like one of them was Micah, I think. Um, one of them was like one of their D linemen who stuck. So, yeah, I, I think Seattle can take a similar approach in the trenches. Like we're getting pushed around our own division. So we're going to try to fix that in the most cost effective way we can, which is the draft. I, I, I gotta say for me, I love the strategy in general. I think the second trade back is, is one too many for me. If it, I would have rather come out of this with the best guard interior prospect I could have found. And I think you could have gotten, you could have definitely gotten Graham Barton at 21. I think I also probably would have felt better about, uh, some of the defensive tackles there, but I love that you ended up with Michael Hall. So the fact is, if you had stuck, you would have had 55, I think. Was it 55 and 21? I think that's yeah. what, yeah, it would have been Miami. Was 55. So, wait, was it? So you, you're you saying you would rather have Barden than Powers Johnson and B. Yes. Actually. Yes. Really? I would. I would. Hmm. I think Barton, I think, I, I think everything I've seen from Barton, I think is. You think is, he's that much better? I do. Okay. I do. So, so like that's I, I where. Think, uh, oh my bad, cut you. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, um, I think one of the things that I like Barton too, I guess, is where I was you're trying to get to. But I think like in a scenario where like the Packers call you and they're like, "We'll give you 25," and I think they have two second round picks because of the Aaron Rodgers yes. trade, and you it move back to 25 money. and you take Barton. Like if you pass on Fontenew, which who I like, but you're like, you know what? It's a negligible difference between him and Barton with the addition of a second round pick. I think yes. that's like. That's the math I'm trying to do in my in my head when I when I do these because I want the good players, but I'll, like I need a bunch of them. <laughs> I, I think you and I are are on the exact same page there. And and Mike, I appreciate you. How did you feel about that draft? We'll wrap up here. Let you get back to being a a dad and a full time reporter. So, um, how how did you feel about that draft? Yeah, I, I like I like the uh, the the more swings. You gotta mm -hmm. just take the swings, man. Some of these guys are not gonna pan out. Some of them are gonna get hurt. It just kind of is what it is. It's the draft. No one bats a thousand. But if you got the right process, you take a lot of swings. You get good value, um, which I think we got in some places. Um, you get good traits. Like so, some of these guys who have really good traits. Like I think Bullard playmaking, um, BB movement, um, Jackson is attitude and center. We took um, like he. He is a, I don't know if you guys follow a Brandon Thorne who does a trench warfare uh, newsletter. Like he did like a film study with, with Jackson. I think it was like his real deal. Uh, at least I think that's what someone did a film study with him, but either way, kids real deal. Um, like I think we got good value. We addressed the trenches. And even if like one or two guys doesn't work out, I think we like, if we bat 50% with our trench guys or whatever, 35% or whatever, I think we came out here a better team than we did. Uh, and enter in the draft. I love it. And, and Mike, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it's been too long. We should not let this much time lapse between the next time we get you on here. Uh, other than on at Mike Dugar on Twitter, where else should folks find you and your content? It, my Twitter or X, whatever it's called, it's pretty much a one-stop shop. You know, the newest episode of our podcast is always pinned to the top of my profile. My author page in The Athletic is in my bio. So if you click on that, you get every story uh, that I've written. Anytime I'm going to appear somewhere on something, I'm, all, it's, I'm always going to retweet it or tweet about it. If I got anything to promote, which I will in July, I believe. I, it was something to promote there. Um, it'll always be I use my social media. So follow me on Twitter. And you'll get everything Seahawks, good takes, bad takes, mo good mocks, bad mocks, podcasts, everything. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, have a great rest of your night. Take Appreciate care. Appreciate you guys having me. Peace. All right. That was the one, the only Mike Dugar. Uh, what a great guest, man. And so, the guy that definitely, you could tell, like, there's so many guys that mail it in. You know, you work, you worked in the media and like, there's a lot of folks that are just playing out the string and they're doing what they have to do because it's a job. And like, look, we've all had jobs where you're just kind of going through the motions. 
it makes such a difference as a fan when you have someone who's that dialed in and thinking about it and thinking along with the team and putting out good content. And Mike's one of those guys. So very cool. Yeah. The fact that he knew guys in like the fifth round, sixth round shows he's doing the work, man. And like, I figured like when we got started, I'm like, Oh man, he might fizzle out. Like he said, he's been not sleeping. He's been like dealing with a kid. I'm like, I don't know if we'll be caught up on the draft and man, he, he's got his guys in the sixth round and the seventh round. That was awesome. He, he was great. Before we wrap up ourselves tonight, uh, I'm curious, Jeff, what's on your mind, man? Where, where are you? You're, you're just you consume as much content as anybody I know. You're paying attention to things going on all around the league. What, what are the storylines that are on your mind? Oh, it's just that conflict right now. I'm still. How do you get this offensive line group figured out and get a second round pick? That is like the thing that's consuming my brain. So much of like the, the podcasting is so focused right now on the quarterbacks. It's like the rest of the league kind of goes out the window. And it's like Penix is like the story of the week. And it's like Penix today is meeting with the Giants. He's meeting with the Raiders. So all the content is just so much on Penix. But for me, it's just like I'm still diving into that second, third round kind of players. And who are the guys I like? Who are the guys that'd be happy taken? It's diving more into those guys. I'm just trying to figure out, okay, who are my guys in this draft? And we've done so many of these. I like to hear different opinions and like Fuag is a guy I heard someone talk about the other day on Mina Kime's show. And it was just like, I got really excited about him. And so like, I'm trying to figure out who are the guy like last year for me was Will Anderson. Like I wanted Will Anderson. I don't know. Didn't, he didn't make the five. I never thought Smith and Jigba was an actual option for them. So that was pretty crazy. But he was being mocked in the top 10. And looking year. back, like the Jets just traded for Hassan Reddick. They took our, the guy you wanted, Will McDonald, and all their I still, I, I'm not out on Will McDonald yet. I know he's 25 like, and everyone's down. I, I like, I still, I believe what I saw. I think he's going to turn out to be a good player. Yeah. Well, like all the Jets writers now are like, why didn't they take Smith and Jigba? Like they have Gary yeah. Wilson there. The Packers last year passed on him. So I don't think he'd make it. So, I'm trying to figure out right now, like, who are my guys? What are other people saying? Like, Matt Miller was on Brock and Salk today talking about some guys he liked. And that was pretty cool. He's not as high on panics, accidentally, as some of the other guys. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, that kind of range, round two, round three. Like, who are the guys I like? And Schneider almost never takes the guys I like. So <laughs> I don't, it might be a f- wasted exercise. And then my stupid baseball team, the Blue Jays. Oh, yeah. I hate them. They have zero runs for the last. They scored two runs in the ninth inning yesterday. They've scored zero runs in 18 of the last 20 innings. So we both hate our baseball teams right now, but let's focus on the good part. I yeah. just saw the Blue Jays score. I got instantly angry. Uh, I hear you, man. I hear you. I, I turned on the Mariners today, middle of the day, and was like, oh, yeah, I got George Kirby starting. It's, it's got to be good. And they're already down five nothing and then I, uh, my nothing. team like, my team got no hit by the fifth starter of the astros i just yeah. looked at the box score they have one hit in, s- in seven innings this, these fucking idiots okay yeah. let's stick with- yeah well i guess uh other pieces of news um the seahawks did announce that they've got a new cap guy um joey coming over from green bay and and matt thomas is leaving the organization I tomorrow on Hawkblogger Mornings am hosting Brad Spielberger as a guest, formerly of Over the Cap, formerly of PFF. And he has now actually got a job at an agency negotiating NFL contracts, which is pretty cool. I am going to ask him tomorrow, like, are there other teams you see taking this path that the Seahawks take with these one year deals that take up massive portion of the cap and then get turned over the next year? Is that, is that something as you, as a negotiator for a contract you'd be asking for? Is that something that, you know, I, I I'm curious if the new guy is going to have any impact on that. John Schneider talked about a little bit on one show that he likes the idea of guys kind of getting to know the organization and vice versa before they commit to a longer term deal. I don't know, man, if that's really a, a hard, if that's a strategy, it is not working. And I, I think it's a flawed strategy. So um, any, any questions you think I should have for Brad tomorrow? 
Uh, yeah, I'd be obviously very curious for him to dive into the Seahawks approach. Um, I think I would ask him why the Seahawks have been so reluctant on things like void years and spreading out cap hits and why they are so inefficient with cap room relative to other teams. Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely get into some of that. And then, uh, I think outside of that, man, I, I, before I think we'll, we'll do one more mock draft. You and me to close out the night for fun. We got to do it. Yeah. I will just remind everybody, please uh, give the show a like, click subscribe. And there is a link in the chat and in the description of the video uh, for how to join both as a YouTube member, which is great. We've got dozens of folks joining. It's growing really quickly. Gives you access to like having a special emblem on your, your profile. So we know if you ask a question or make a comment, we pay attention more there. We'll actually answer those comments post show where appropriate. Um, and man, you know what I forgot to do and I'm killing myself. We got to do this right now. We did not do patron questions. All I right, meant to do that with Mike. Let's, let's ditch the mock draft then. We'll we got to ditch the mock draft. We got to do patron questions. What a mistake. Patreon.com slash Hawk blogger. Our patrons deserve to have their questions addressed and, I apologize, folks. I was, uh, I spaced. I just got so into at talking to Mike. I didn't even think about what other people wanted to ask Mike. So apologies there, but let's get to him now. First question comes from Sean Pyle and it says, would you trade DK Metcalf to Kansas city for pick 32 and maybe a little bit extra? No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think you mentioned earlier this, the lack of position groups that the Seahawks have. And the lack of blue chip kind of players. I don't think the 32nd pick in the draft. I don't think, I think if I'm going to trade DK, I'm probably going to trade him in a year where we can kind of build his value back up. And I want to see him with Ryan Grubbs offense. I would yeah. love to see him. I want to see that guy in Grubbs offense. And then if he ends up the same kind of player with this offensive corner, then I think I'd explore trading him next year where he's in the last year of his deal. And but to me, I don't think it makes sense. I think you're taking away from one of your only strengths. I agree. And I think I would actually, the only thing I'd say differently is if he has a, just a pop year next year and just explodes, then I'd look at potentially trading him. <laughs> right. That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. You don't trade like, a guy when his values, like you saw what Diggs went for. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'd want, I'd want Tyreek Hill level, you know, um, yeah, great. demand. Eric asks, during the coaching search, there was a stated focus on teaching and analytics. Is there any thought that this will affect the way that the team drafts? Do you maybe see a trade-off between projectable attributes against historical stats and film? And thanks for the daily podcast. They have been fantastic. Well, thank you, Eric. Glad you're enjoying them. What do you think, Jeff? You think that there's going to be a change to trading off projectable attributes against historical stats and film? If Mike McDonald was running the draft, probably. If Schneider's running the draft, I get the sense absolutely not. Um, his free agency looks exactly like every free agency we've seen. The players they've invested in, the positions they've invested in, the contracts. And then you hear some of his comments on the radio every week, and you wonder, is Schneider's ego going to be out of control now that he's in charge? Mm. You wonder it. It's not. I'm not saying it's happening, but you have to yeah. wonder it. I don't get the sense. I think McDonald will impact their evaluations and his staff. And I know McDonald is very analytical and very into analytics. I think it's going to be John's show. And I, I don't think. I think I'd be surprised if there's a big change. Yeah, my my thought is the analytics reference is more to how the game is managed and I, how they – you talk about sports science as well, You know how they take care of guys, give them time off, um, stuff like that. So – I think that's more what John was referring to. I don't think it's going to affect the scouting as much. Um, Jason A asks, which current Seahawk switching sports to baseball would immediately make the Mariners better? Oh, my God. I mean, it's hard to project if any of them could hit. Julian Love is a pretty good all-around athlete, and he's a golfer. So I'm thinking maybe his hand-eye coordination and and swinging the bat might be decent. Uh, that comes to mind, but it has to be someone that could hit. 
And uh, like DK Metcalf is like, oh, he's a great athlete. I'm not sure DK Metcalf can swing a bat. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't doesn't strike me as a guy. Maybe JSN, his brothers in in Major League Baseball. Maybe he's he's an option. Um, all right. Anders asks, saw a mock where we traded back and pick linebacker in the first round, Peyton Wilson. Last time this happened with 2020, where our draft through four rounds was Brooks, Taylor, Lewis, and Parkinson. What's the likelihood Schneider uses the same approach to this draft, except picking defensive tackle instead of edge in the second round? And what would your reaction be if this scenario played out? Could end up with Peyton Wilson, Tavondre Sweat, or Michael Hall, Zinter or Puny, and one of your favorite tight ends in the through four rounds. I would love round two. I'd love round three, and I'd love round four. Round one, taking a linebacker does not work for me. Um, I think a it's a position that's not a premium position. Peyton Wilson is really the only one you could probably make a case for, and he's got a ton of medical questions. We saw what happened when they took Daryl Taylor with all those medical questions; he had to miss a season, and. I think the offensive linemen, the defensive linemen, and even edge, I think the Seahawks have to come out of this first round with one of them. But I love what you said in round two, three, and four. So if they get Sweat, Tavondre Sweat, and Zach Sinter, those are two of my favorite players in the draft. So I'm, I'm not going to be mad if you do that, but there's got to be someone better than – you can move down to 27 and take another spot other than linebacker. To me, I it's one of those things where you'd be overvaluing a positional need versus taking the best player on the board. Yeah, I, I don't hate it as much as you if that what they project for Wilson is a blue chip linebacker. He may be he may be the only blue chip linebacker in this draft um, in terms of traits. As much as I like Junior Colson, I'm not sure I see a blue chip linebacker in Junior Colson. I think that Edge Cooper is a guy who could go very early second round and could be a blue chip linebacker but not necessarily a coverage backer in the same way. And so I don't think he's really a, a premium fit for the Seahawks. So what I like about the question here from Anders is it is wise about trying to maximize the value. I am starting to feel like Hall or Sweat in the second round is ideal. I do like a lot of these guards and I am talking myself into like, I don't feel myself feeling that upset when they're getting a, a, a puny or when they're getting uh, Mason McCormick or some of these guys a little bit later, but it's, it's a projection. Zach Zinter, right. You know, like it'd be really excited about some of those guys, but it's not the same as, is drafting a, a Graham Barton or a Troy Fatanu and like immediately knowing going into the season that you've really upgraded that position. All right. Dustin Eden asks Brian on Monday morning's show, you shared some great thoughts on Pete's influence on the Seahawks frequent overreaching for running backs in early rounds and how the current depth at running back means that we are unlikely to prioritize that position in this year's draft. With all that context, in what round do you think we'll draft a running back this year? <laughs> That's a fantastically worded question, Dustin Eden. Uh, so um, I don't think it's crazy to think they might draft a running back in the late rounds this year due to the kick return stuff where a lot of folks are projecting that it'll be – more running back style returners instead of quick returners, but guys that can break tackles and be elusive in that way. But I don't think they're going to draft a running back this year. I don't think they're going to do it. Um, Colin asks, I'd love for you to ask Michael Sean, who his favorite player is to cover talk or moment has been. That would have been a great question, Colin, if I had been smart enough to yeah. ask and look at these uh, uh, before. Um, all right, so let's look at the next one. Um, Sam Brown asks, who would you say are all the actual blue chippers, chip players in this draft? I think some tend to think that if a player has a first round grade, that makes them a blue chip player. But I'd say there's more eight to 10 of them at most in this draft. That's a fair question, Jeff. Uh, would it help for me to pull up like the PFF top 100 so you could look at that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for sure Marvin Harrison Jr. is a blue chip player. That guy would be number one pick in a bunch of drafts. 
he is maybe the best prospect at receiver we've seen since like Larry Fitzgerald. Uh, Malik Neighbors is an absolute blue chip prospect. Um, his electric speed. Look, PFF's got Marvin right there too. Uh, Malik Neighbors is four. I think Joe Alt is a, a blue chip left tackle prospect. I think Brock Bowers is a blue chip prospect. After that, I think Fuaga and Futayanu have the chance to be. I think they're more tiered down, but Tristan Wirfs, who's if you're drafting like the best tackles moving forward in the NFL that you'd want to have right now, it would probably be like Sewell one and Tristan Wirfs might be two. I see a lot of similarity between Fuaga and Tristan Wirfs. And I see Fautanu in that range too. So those guys have the potential. I think they're right on that edge line, but really this top of the draft, I don't see you're pretty deep now. Like I don't see Byron Murphy. Like, do you think Byron Murphy's a blue chip prospect? Well, it depends on how you're defining blue chip. I guess the way I kind of think about it is there's guys who I think have blue chip ceilings because that's how you have to think about it. None of these guys are blue chippers yet. They all have to realize their potential. And then there's the probability that they will reach that. And so it's a two part analysis because there's guys that honestly, they could be really good. They're high floor players, but they don't have the ceiling to ever be blue chip. Like for me, um, let me pick one here that I think fits that category. I think Bo Nix for me, fits that category i think he is a high floor quarterback prospect that i don't believe is a blue chip has the potential to be a true elite quarterback so he's not a blue chip kind of prospect for me but a guy that is the kind of in a different uh ballpark and i'm trying to see where is he on this um keeps moving around so maybe he's moved farther down Wow, you to me, Tavondre Sweat at 74 on their list. Tavondre Sweat's a guy that has blue chip ceiling to me. He has Vita. If you consider Vita Vea to be a blue chip player, who I do, I think he's got that kind of potential. The probability that he reaches it, I also think is pretty darn good. And so that is part of why I get really excited about a guy like him because, because there's other reasons that he will fall in the draft. I've got a first round grade on Tavondre Sweat. I think he is that level of impact player. The NFL doesn't value two down players that much. They definitely, there's not every team that wants a 360 pound nose tackle. I think for the Seahawks, Tavondre Sweat could be one of the best values for, you know, for draft selection that they're going to find. I think that uh, Michael Hall Jr., is a guy that has blue chip potential and I think has a decent chance of reaching that potential, but he's way down here. I mean, I don't know where they've got him on this list. Uh, Whatever. Um, But so I I guess I see some guys like, I'm not sure. I don't personally see Johnny Newton as a blue chip player. I see Johnny Newton as, you know, maybe he can reach to be a Leonard Williams level. I think that's even asking a lot. But he could get drafted a lot earlier. Byron Murphy, for me, is a guy that has blue chip potential. I see that. I think there's you know questions of reaching it, but I, I, I see it. I agree with you on Fautanu. Jared Verse for that, for me, is certainly one of them. I think a lot of the tackles in this draft have the potential to be blue chip guys. I haven't spent a lot of time on the tackles because I don't think that's a position the Seahawks are going to prioritize in the first few rounds, if at all in this draft some of the cornerbacks i think are in that category so what about, what about graham barton graham barton for me absolutely like the more i've watched of them the more i see him as absolutely being a blue chip level guy and he's he's right there with me with fotanu like i think i think he's he's right there um for what the seahawks need i think fotanu gets drafted earlier because i think fotanu is has the chance to be more of a tackle if you need him to in the in the NFL. Barton doesn't. I, I just don't see Barton with his arm length being a true tackler at his height. I think he can be an elite guard. And since that's what I'm looking for, and Fautano, that's where I'd be projecting him, that's why I value them differently than I think NFL teams will value them. Um, wow. And I think, we again, do. I like that because you can get them lower and still get blue chip value. 
We we draft for our team, Brian, not for the league. That's that is right, Jeff. So I we didn't really answer the question because I don't feel like counting all these guys, but hopefully that conversation was helpful um, for Sam. Um, Kristen Fonti asks Dana a question. Oh. Uh, so Dana's not on. Uh, we'll 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 let Dana answer uh, in Slack if she can get on there at some point and look for Kristen's uh, question. Derek Woods asked, with Mike having his first team gathering starting on Monday, what are you most and least wanting to hear reported about when Mike McDonald does, or does it matter at all? So Monday, Jeff, is is I think it's just like workouts. Like I think yeah, it's, like it's strength and conditioning kind of stuff. Yeah, like well, we were not gonna see his first team meeting with the team. Like I know the Falcons put that out for Raheem Morris, but we never saw Pete Carroll's team meetings. I don't even know if there's going to be a lot of media. It's like involuntary workouts, strength and conditioning, phase one of OTAs. But I know Mike's been excited. He's been talking about it. it's his first time to get around the guys and really set the tone for what he wants his team to be. And so I think it's more exciting for him than it probably is for us. I don't think we're going to learn much of anything. I think it's just him really setting the tone of what this, what his program is going to be, what he's all about. And this is his show now. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I guess the, it's a it's it's voluntary. So what I'll be looking for is who shows up. That's the number one thing. Is like is is there maybe there's some guys that show up that don't normally. Um, maybe you learn something about some of the new guys showing up and how they demonstrate their commitment. So that's the number one thing for at least this first reporting period when it's when it's optional. A um, couple more here. Jason asks. How likely is John to trade 2025 picks to move into this year's draft? I think we both agree it's pretty unlikely, right? Yeah, I don't think he wants to be in a scenario like he is right now. Yeah, I think he, I think I imagine if you gave them truth serum, I don't know if they'd regret the Leonard Williams trade because even though they re-signed him, but I think John hates not having draft picks. Yeah, yeah. The one thing I'll say is. I think the reality that Jim Nagy talked about with um, the changes to college football, meaning that a lot of guys are staying in college and the bottom half of the draft has less quality players. That's not going to change anytime soon. So to me, if John Schneider wants to take a fifth round pick or a sixth round pick or a seventh round pick next year to bundle that together to get something earlier in this draft i'm all for it and he might do that that would actually be smart but I, i'm not expecting that to happen all right two more questions max uh asks what's the significant significance of matt thomas's departure what do we know about his replacement joey lane any any thoughts there jeff no i'm actually really curious to kind of dive into this i thought it was very interesting that it came out that he's leaving the organization i don't know if that's a personal choice i don't know if they've let him go but I have not been very fond of their decisions of how they've used their salary cap. Um, I know they've done a really good job like getting rid of contracts that we've thought were pretty obvious to get rid of year after year. But I don't, I don't honestly, I don't know. I usually have an answer for this stuff. I usually have a read. Matt Thomas has been their cap guy since Schneider got there. Um, he was his handpicked guy. I don't know if that's something that just Thomas wanted a new challenge. I don't know if there's a falling out. I don't know if it, Schneider quietly firing him. But I'm really fascinated. I don't know if we'll ever even learn that. But I'm fascinated to see that there is a new direction. I'm hoping it's for the better because I think they can be better at using the cap. And but again, I, I don't. I don't know if you have a read on it, but I really don't. I don't. I don't. I'll ask Brad about him tomorrow. See if he knows anything about this guy, and and we'll kind of go from there. But we'll we'll we'll. Uh, it, it was a meaningful change, and uh, for GM. Their cap guy is kind of a right-hand person. Um, they have to make all sorts of decisions and constantly evaluating those decisions with that person. We can all hope it changes some of the strategy because I don't think the Seahawks have necessarily been best of breed when it comes to cap. I don't think they've been as bad as some people say either. I don't think it's been terrible. It's not like they've been signing all these crazy long-term deals. Uh, that's the that's way worse than these one-year deals that we're frustrated about. So, um but yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see and, and learn a little bit more together. Last question. A second one from Anders says, how are y'all going to feel when we inevitably trade back and the Rams draft either Michael Penix or Byron Murphy, who will wreak havoc on us for years to come? 
How do you feel? Oh, about we're that, both Jeff? we're both going to be completely miserable. Um, the Rams haven't had a first round pick in like ten years, and it's their first one. If they end up taking one of our guys, it's going to eat at us because the Rams like it seemed like the Rams were doomed last year, and then with way less capital, they somehow outdrafted the Seahawks last year with the fifth and twentieth pick. So if they come back and then they get one of our guys, that's just going to be because the Rams have been a thorn in our side for really all of the Pete Carroll era. And Sean McVay, since he got there, has been even Jeff Fisher was kicking our ass when we had mm-hmm. way better teams than him. Oh, we're we're both going to be furious. I think that's the worst case scenario other than San Francisco getting one of those guys. Yeah, I, I think that. We talk about Howie Roseman a lot. I've liked a lot of how he prioritizes the trenches and and some of the decisions he's made. Uh, I think Les Snead, I mean, like you look down at what the Rams have done and they haven't haven't done things that I would necessarily suggest doing. They've traded away in the first round picks for veteran players and given them big money contracts, Jalen Ramsey, you know, they've done all those kind of things. I think their off season has been fantastic. I think it's been fantastic. I think this, you know, they got their two guards now. Uh, one of them I'm quite high on in Jonah Jackson. They've got Steve Avila from last year who they now move into center. They got Darius Williams coming back to play corner and they signed Tredavious White, who if he's healthy, which is a big if, but you know, is a pretty dang good uh, addition there. Um, so I, I think the Rams have made a lot of good choices and their draft picks last year certainly were great. Uh, we've talked about for a while, you know, the Seahawks have been playing catch up on the coaching side. They have not had the scheme advantage in the NFC West for a long time. Uh, now you got to ask some questions about whether they've got a GM advantage, uh, disadvantage in the, in the, in the division. So John Schneider's got to prove that there's nothing he has done this off season to demonstrate that he's got a Midas touch that we should all feel really good about There's not a single player that anyone can point to to say that was a fantastic signing and it, you know, a great get. I don't believe any of them, even if they work out, even if Baker works out or Tyrell Dodson works out or, you know, you know, Kayvon Wallace works out they're on one year deals. So, you know, you didn't change the trajectory of your team um, with what they've done so far this off season. And, I think you could make the case the Rams did and the Rams see the chance to really go all in and we'll see. I think the Rams are in a very good spot. I think the Packers are even in a better spot in the NFC. The lions are in a very good spot. And the reality is the Seahawks have a ton, a ton of work to do and they have to get lucky. They have to hit, not just on the first round, they gotta ha- find they gotta find their Puka Nakua in the fifth round, or their Cam Chancellor, or their Richard Sherman, or their Earl Tom. You know, all these guys late like not Earl Thomas wasn't later, but the other guys later round picks. Malcolm Smith, Super Bowl MVP, seventh round pick, like Doug you, Baldwin, you got, yeah, Doug Baldwin, undrafted free agent, Jermaine Kirsch. Like you need those guys. So Schneider's got a lot of work to do, and so does Mike McDonald. Um, Jeff. Let's just make sure people know that beyond joining and joining the YouTube membership, which you can do in chat or here, also patreon.com slash blogbloggers. Thank you for folks that submitted questions. We have answered them this week, even if it took us a little while to get to them. Thank you for doing that. That is a privilege of being a patron. You also get immediate access to the Slack channel. You get all the audio versions of every podcast except for this one, which you also get, but everybody gets this one. But all the daily podcasts we're doing are only available to people that are patrons. Patreon.com slash Hawkblogger should join. And Jeff, announcing it now, the one and only draft show that any Seahawks fan needs to watch is going to start this Sunday. People loved it when we had Griffin Sturgeon see Mike Spin Move on Saturday uh, this weekend. And then we followed that up with Rob Staten on Sunday. Everybody loved those shows. We thought, why make them separate? This is peanut butter and chocolate. Let's bring them together. So we are going to have a draft roundtable. A weekly one is what we're shooting for. The first episode will air Sunday. We're going to have it 2 o'clock Pacific time is what's planned. Um, it'll be Jeff Simmons, myself, 
uh, Rob Staten and Griffin Sturgeon uh, talking draft. We're going to talk about it from all different angles. Obviously, Griff has his, his film study. Rob is super thorough. You and I have our own perspectives and bringing things in. So we're going to pull that together and have, uh, I think, what's going to be the best draft coverage anywhere. Forget it. Blog, podcast, real reporters, whatever you want. I think that's going to be as good a draft content as you're going to find. In order to get the audio versions of that, you got to be a patron. Patreon.com slash Hawkblogger. Now's the time to sign up. If you're watching the show, give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Folks, we are on the march towards 10,000 subscribers. We're just short of 9,500. So click the subscribe button. Go ahead and do that. Very easy. And uh, Jeff, I will see you soon. Maybe you and I will do a mock draft madness uh, in between one of these because I know we, we we get obsessed and we'll do that. We haven't had one of those for a little while. Yeah, we're, we're three weeks out tomorrow. So let's we're do getting, it. Let's do it. Get to that time. All right, that is Jeff Simmons at Real Jeff Simmons on Twitter. You can find him there. I recommend doing it. I am Brian Nemhauser. You can find me at Hawk Blogger on Twitter. And every morning now with Hawk Blogger Mornings, tomorrow Brad Spielberger will be on. Friday morning, Rob Rang from Fox Sports will be on. And uh, a lot more great content to come. This has been another episode of Real Hawk Talk. Take care, everybody.